questions because I think it would be important maybe first um, for uh, Benjamin Barber um, to comment um, on how he sees um, what has been said. First of all, of course, uh, Martin Albro, the uh, very, very strong uh, case of showing us how uh, civil society and what we understand uh, as citizens has really changed. Uh, and looking back at the 70s uh, with the Bürger Initiative, I think that was a very, very good uh, example uh, of how our understanding has changed. But maybe we can just uh, first, uh, before we uh, deepen on the, on the conversation, ask Benjamin, um, would you like to comment on uh, how you see um, these two presentations fit into your ideas of uh, the uh, new role of the, um, of the mayors? and the cities. That's thank you. One of the problems always with these conferences is that we all come and talk about what we're interested in and not with one another. And as a result, we have now three presentations laying on the table, one from last night and two from this morning, with, which touch each other only peripherally, and which it's up to us to try to figure out the relationship. And maybe in our discussion now, we can try to join and see if we can uh, see where we agree, where we disagree, and where we have common, uh, common ground. Uh, let me say, making those connections myself, that you can't talk about cities and mayors without talking about civil society. Uh, the urban civil society, I think, is at the heart of civil society generally. And while my book is called If Mayors Rule the World, my preferred title would have been if mayors, city managers, ward managers, citizens, civil society, and the private sector ruled the world. My publisher said that wasn't a very good title, uh, however, so I stuck with if mayors uh, ruled the world. But uh, without question, when we talk about uh, the city, uh, we talk about citizens, the etymology is there, citoyen, cité. Uh, they have the same root. Uh, the citizen, in fact, is the city, the urban dweller first of all, and they are constituted, first of all, not as voters and electors for the mayor or the city council, but as members of their own civil society. And one of the great things about the city I tried to talk about last night was that the locality, uh, the neighborhood character of cities, the intimacy and the density of cities permit the citizens to work together, talk together, and build civic institutions that are at the heart of the city, whether they're cultural, institutions uh, or uh, NGOs or PTAs or other forms of block associations where citizens do the heavy lifting themselves. And uh, mayors, uh, far from being charismatic power dominators, are people who depend on citizens and civic collaboration. They have no real power. They don't have armies and navies. They don't give commands. Have you ever heard of mayors giving a command? Not even Boris, charismatic as he is gives commands. He rides a bike around London and tries to get other Londoners, uh, like the ones here, to work with him. Uh, so mayors depend on collaboration, depend on bringing in every part of society, and in a certain sense, civil society represents the civic underbelly, the civic infrastructure of cities, which is why Tocqueville was so drawn to his study of municipalities and cities when he came to the United States, and where he talked as much about civil society in the cities he visited as he did about municipal government. Government, in a certain sense, was secondary then, and it remains secondary uh, now. And I uh, very happily invited two people to talk about different aspects of civil society, of building society, and so forth. Uh, here and not simply people to talk about uh, talk about government. Uh, I do want to make one or two just quick critical uh, points, though. Too interestingly, there is here a focus on a kind of the Corbusier plan city. It doesn't surprise me that from messy neighborhood, historic, traditional London come two advocates of French planning and the Corbusier and the vertical city and all of the disasters. Uh, that have accompanied Le Corbusier and that approach to cities, because unfortunately we often miss the virtues of our own city. And the great virtue of London is that it is a traditional city, messy, 
that grew out of neighborhoods and villages knit together. I view that as a strength, not a weakness, and the attempt now to impose the Copiusia type verticality with these monstrous buildings, which it's okay in Canary Wharf, but if they start dying, all of London will destroy uh, London. The what you called elegant uh, little buildings like 157 going up in New York are absolutely destroying New York, and something we need to talk about is when you build those buildings, the only people who can occupy them are wealthy corporations or wealthy foreigners. 80% of the apartments in the new vertical monstrosities, these residential towers in New York, are owned by foreigners who are never there. And those buildings are empty. They sit empty even though they are, quote, occupied. And they not only destroy the physical landscape, they destroy the neighborhood as well. So I think we might want to talk a little bit about uh, the verticality and what that means. We know in China, we have created a uh, 100 new cities over a million in a couple of years, all of which are vertical, none of which have neighborhoods, all of which are Corbusier type constructions. And there is no sense in those cities of what a real city means. Finally, just you're quite right to ask how democratic are cities. It's a very good question. We have to ask that question. My answer is always as compared to what? As compared to the government of the UK, London, Manchester, Bristol are very democratic. As compared to a block association, as a citizen group, perhaps they're somewhat less democratic. But the relevant question is as compared to what? And I think the cities deserve a chance to play a greater role in global governance than they have till now, which was my subject last night, which I won't rehearse this morning. Thank you. Okay. Um, we shall certainly be hearing more about, uh, especially of course about um, the changing face of skylines in London when we uh, join uh, the talk with uh, Nigel Barker uh, later today. Um, but just a comment on what you said to start with. Isn't the common denominator of um, the three uh, talks uh, at the moment the transformational capacity of civil urban um, society? Is that not the, the common denominator? And I think in uh, already in what uh, you have said, uh, we see that that is not easy to, to attain. So maybe um, I would um, ask Tim Murray, um, obviously we have very different ideas <coughs> of what we think city should be, or what society should be, um, from the messy neighborhoods um, uh, which um, are full of color and vibrancy to uh, the more planned, um, just as I think, Probably the way you live in uh, your apartment will be very different to the way I live in my apartment. So, um, uh, if I just ask uh, uh, Peter Murray, um, how, how do you how do you mediate between very very different ideas? I and mean, it's not just people with power or not with power. Obviously, a major aspect. Uh, people with able to make direct decisions or people just able to vote out there. Uh, town councils. Um, how do you mediate about um, what the ideas are behind what, where we're supposed to be going? Uh, well, I, I, I think in terms of the physical environment, the role of the civil society are, is getting the broadest possible access to information so that you actually have some sort of balance. And I would say to uh, respond to Benjamin's point about Corbusier, actually, the thing is that uh, most Corbusian uh, developments were uh, very tightly planned, they were just differently planned. It wasn't only about tall buildings. And interestingly enough, what is happening in New York and what is happening in London is a result of a uh, rather messy, pragmatic, laissez faire attitude to planning, which uh, creates messy neighborhoods which people like, and also tends to create messy skylines which maybe uh, people don't actually like. And I think that one of the interesting things which is happening at the moment is that that untidiness is now facing much stronger pressures than it ever has because of globalisation, because of exactly the issues that you're talking about, the 
pressure of global capital, the pressure of global investors, the uh, safety of cities like uh, London and New York in the face of the problems, whether it's in Greece or in Turkey or in uh, parts of the Middle East, uh, uh, the become havens for um, uh, finance, and you are getting a situation where it's quite right. It says these tall buildings are being purchased by overseas investors, and uh, they are creating uh, potential for large dead neighbourhoods, or no neighbourhoods at all, just empty uh, shells. And how we deal with that while uh, retaining uh, the, um, uh, I'd say the, the, the looser sort of planning that made the character of London over. Uh, you know, 2,000 years, um, how do we uh, <coughs> control uh, the influx of capital and the city? And I think we are getting round to a view in London now that we do need to look at a slightly more formal arrangement of how we put the city together uh, rather than allowing the forces of global capital to shape the way the city looks and works. Another of the main issues we are speaking about uh, this morning is, um, Martin, how do we, how do we develop, or how do we see the de development of interest for the global? I mean, do we really, if, we, if we're being sociologically um, honest, do we really find uh, people in New York or in, in London uh, being uh, interested as citizens for citizens in uh, Nigeria or in <coughs> or wherever. Um, is that still just a more a, a, a utopian notion that we do somehow know um, interdependency, um, we, which you talked about, um, a very, very important part, but is there a true interest or is that something that we just try to project <coughs> as being um, something which may come later? The, the, the global. Uh, yes, it should be on. It should be on. Yes. Is this on? Yes. The the global interdependency of London is achieved in part because most people who live in London have not been born in London, mm. and a yes. very large proportion <laughs> have in fact. Uh, got homes in other parts of the world. And, and the number of communities in London is enormous. I remember uh, lecturing in, in Munich in the 1990s, and I, I said in my lectures, well, my local school where I live has 55 languages in it, 55 languages spoken by children in the school. This was in the 1990s, and the reaction of my audience was just horror. Uh, but that is normal in London. That this is normal in London, and of course, the relations between those people in, living in London and the rest of the world is intimate. They travel back and forth all the time. They remit money to each other all the time. So the, inter the global interdependency of London is, as it were, built into its population structure. So there's no problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there's, there are problems, okay. but, but um, the interdependency is there. Me too. Uh, uh, it, it, I just add to that that actually one of the uh, uh, selling points of Atlantic and the Olympics was that uh, we could find local communities for every single team that went through the Olympics. Um, but within that, I would say that uh, you know, that that shift in terms of the diversity in London is actually fairly new. London mm. is traditionally an international trading city. Um, uh, we heard last night about Hansa. I mean, it was a Hansa city and, uh, in the uh, 16th century, but also then in uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century, uh, gradually extended its uh, role until, of course, during the British Empire, it was the focus of uh, uh, world trade, the busiest port in, in, in the world. And that is what also then led it to become uh, the uh, one of the centres of global finance, and uh, that's a, a, a role that it continues today, even after the uh, problems of 2008. Thank you. We've, we slide between the role of corporate capital in building these new buildings and the planned city, but the planning of the city and the input of the citizens seems only to be made about placements exactly. The, the act
actual money is coming from corporate capital and they are calling the shots. And here we perhaps all agree that we need a much greater civic and political role in that planning process because if corporate capital decides what sorts of buildings will be built and where and for which purposes, then those buildings will lack much of the civic purpose that, that we're interested in. But the bike share programs you described and you've participated in are rich and wonderful programs, but on the whole, corporate culture is not much interested uh, in bike lanes. Uh, they oppose them. They want more highways, more cars. Uh, more petrol, more of the carbon industry, and for them, they'll put up with it. Sometimes they even support it for greenwashing reasons. You know that nice term, greenwashing, like whitewashing. When Shell Company uh, talks a little bit about resilience, they prove that they care uh, about issues uh, of carbon. So, but I think we really do have to emphasize that, that today. When I talk about governance of cities, or we talk about the United Nations and the governance of states, those are all aspirants to a global power actually in the hands of global capital today. And our friend Klaus Hoffa, who is still very active, still very engaged, was right a long time ago to point out that when we <coughs> ignore the role of money, finance, capital, and capital, you don't have to be a Marxist to understand that that money plays a powerful, powerful role in how cities are made and how they are planned. And if we just talk about, is the mayor more civic or is civil society more civic? Where do you get the democratic legitimacy from the voter or from the mayor? We are forgetting those who actually rule the world today. Because the question of who rules the world doesn't take place in a vacuum. It has rulers. They're called global banks. They're called global, global corporations. And they rule by default. I mean, they, they rule because nobody else does. And they're there. They're global. They're international. And they spend money as they will. And they use it to buy governments when they can. So I think our discussion, to be complete, has to talk also about that role, whether it's in architecture and planning uh, or in uh, the nature of who actually is governing the world currently. Okay. Last year, uh, but I agree we have to um, we have to look at the uh, finance world, especially when we're thinking about um, the, the the global cities. Indeed, uh, I mean we are now talking about the global cities. I think in many other cities we have similar questions of participation of planning, but maybe at a, at a, at a lower uh, level because they are not they, are, they don't have this global. So, is there is it? Can we just perhaps talk about participation as as a concept? Um, without the global, can we think of participatory models as you are working on in, in London, uh, which will work to draw in uh, citizens to being involved in what uh, and, and how their cities are, uh, in, uh, are are changing without the global idea, and, and then we can perhaps again look at the global. Where obviously uh, there are different mechanisms and different powers. Um, which have a huge influence, which we may, may not see in, in many of the sort of decentralised cities. Would someone like to comment on that? Yeah. Well, uh, in, in UK at the moment, uh, we have a general election coming up soon, so how long will it continue? Who knows? But uh, the current coalition government do have a localism agenda where they have been uh, moving decision making a uh, number of uh, areas down to local levels and that involves now uh, uh, communities being able to have a referendum to decide to deliver their own local plan. It, the local plan still has to work within a wider uh, area plan but uh, uh, local uh, groups can actually now start forming the shape and, uh, of, of, of their own neighbourhoods. That, that is beginning to work. And uh, as we heard uh, from Martin, that uh, the uh, vote over Scottish uh, independence actually had a major impact on thinking about uh, regions of uh, Britain and also about cities. And London has long been trying to get more of its taxes to be spent locally. At the moment, almost, uh, I think uh, London is, uh, has the least uh, amount of tax which is kept within the area. Everything goes up to government, and then government very kindly gives some of the money back. And uh, so what we're, uh, there is a strong 
that movement now, and uh, it started with Manchester, as Martin was talking about, but uh, we think that probably uh, in the next few years we will see a redistribution of that money, so that, that money can be spent more locally, and that actually does give more power to local people, because they can see where their taxes, where the money is like, directly going. When it comes to the government, somehow it lacks identity. Remaining at the local, at the international local, um, one of the, the points that you have all been making is, of course, the internationality, the multiculturalism in cities. Are you reaching all communities? Or do you find that that the interest, uh, the, the, the knowledge, or um, the, the, reach, the reaching, uh, the outreach to certain communities um, is not so easy? Um, are they involved? Uh, do they want to be involved, or are they just not properly involved? I think in different cities and in different countries, uh, that question uh, ha would have very different answers. This is fascinating, but I'm not sure we capture the problem of difference in diversity by examining a wealthy lawyer living next to a very rich foreigner. I don't think that's the central problem of diversity and multiculturalism in, in modern cities. If it were, I'd say, well, we're doing pretty well. If the only problem is very wealthy lawyers have to live next to people even richer than they are, I think we can deal with that. The problem we have in Europe and in other places is immigrant populations from different ethnic and religious backgrounds who are utterly excluded from the societies in which they are immigrants, uh, who find not just with respect to wealth but with respect to religion that they are not in any meaningful sense citizens of the places in which they are. And the rifts that divide those populations from citizens we know from what's happened in London and Paris and Madrid and elsewhere run very deep and issue in violence that's exacerbated them by foreign zealots uh, who either get people locally to do their work or come themselves and do work. That problem is much worse. I mean, to me, the two great contextual issues for the discussion of local democracy and is the mayor or the citizen more democratic is global wealth, which we've talked about, but the other is the global cultural schism between Islam and uh, the rest of the world and the view that we have and the struggle and decision we have to make as to whether it's Islam itself that is pathological, which I think is wrong, but many people want to think is right, and those who think that a schismatic, excessive terrorist group is exploiting a distorted view of Islam uh, to wreak vengeance on societies that have excluded ordinary Muslims. But that question runs deep, and again, I don't think we can begin to talk about the problem of diversity and multiculturalism unless we confront that problem, because I, even I'm guilty of that. I talked happily about diversity and multiculturalism in our cities, but that covers up these deep rifts and the fact that we have a divided society here in Karlsruhe, in Frankfurt, in Berlin, in London, and in New York between those who come from somewhere else, often from a different religion, and feel that they are made enemies by the society in which they live. And the violence we see as a result, the terrorism we see that is racking on urban societies is a result of that, and on the whole, we're simply not uh, dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Benjamin, that's a very, very major point, which uh, we at SAC have often gone into, and will also in the future go into. We certainly shall this afternoon, uh, when we talk about the Pegida movement, we will uh, be going into uh, this kind of question, um, at least a little bit. Um, I look at um, Peter Murray and uh, would you like to comment? And then I would have three quick questions from the public before we go for our coffee break. Yeah, I, no, I absolutely agree with that. I'm not sure I can add, add much to it except to uh, discuss uh, how that impacts on uh, the, the physical city. And uh, in London, we have at one end, we do have these, uh, uh, what Benjamin calls Corbusian, I wouldn't agree they're Corbusian, but these Corbusian towers being sold for uh, up to uh, 60 million pounds to uh, uh, overseas investors. And we also have uh, communities who are living in sheds at the bottom of gardens where um, they are recreating some of the informal settlements uh, from the places they've come. And there are wealthy boroughs in uh, London who are now saying, 
we have to accept this as a part of the informal planning because we, we can't actually provide the housing for them. So uh, we accept it and we monitor them just for safety so they make sure they're safe from fire and make sure they have basic services. But in terms of the planning system, the planning system is unable to deal with the pressures of uh, these uh, communities. And uh, they are, uh, to a certain extent, then outside the, 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 the normal realm of, 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 of control in the city. And uh, um, yet, yeah, for us, in terms of involving uh, wider ethnic groups, uh, it is actually uh, very difficult in, in London. Yeah, because one, there are many of them and they have different relationships uh, to their local communities. And uh, the Olympics, because it was uh, held in the East End, uh, which was uh, where they had uh, their, the, the local borough has to translate all its uh, information into 72 different languages. And uh, that this was a main focus of a lot of the work that was done uh, in term, using the, the investment that came in for the Olympics to uh, try and uh, involve, but also uh, raise up the... Has that been sustainable? Uh, so far it is actually. I think the, the, the uh, whole um, strategy of the Olympics was uh, a, a, a resilient uh, plan that would continue on into the future. So the legacy is actually uh, Im important and uh, we, uh, can go to uh, uh, the area around the Olympics today. And actually, uh, it's, it's, uh, I find it very impressive what has happened. It's not the sort of windswept uh, uh, empty uh, concrete uh, bunkers that uh, one has been fearing. It's actually a very active and busy uh, environment. Thank you very much.